Chapter 9 Day's Sorrow, Night's Wrath He sat beside the hearth in the Moon Palace kitchen, watching Longclaw sniff curiously at the corners of the room. Longclaw, can you understand me? Longclaw ambles over to you, nuzzling her nose into your palm and huffing amiably. At least some part of you seems to recognize me. It's hard to see your friend without her, one of her fine dresses. It's even harder to not be able to understand her. I know you had to eat the berries to keep you and your family safe, but I wish... Perched high in the rafters, Merlin pauses, the noisy nibbling of a berry in their claws. Your friend? She was my friend. Swallow. Correcting yourself. She is my friend. Oh, Longclaw. I could really use your advice right now. How am I ever going to tell Karen that Jack is his half brother? It's going to upend his world. He admired his mother so much to learn that she kept this from everyone. He stroke her golden fur and fight back tears. Longclaw lets out a soft, sad rumble, sensing your distress. At least you survived. Thanks to your quick thinking, and as long as we're still alive, there's still hope. We'll find a way to get you back to your old self. I promise. Oleander swans into the kitchen, a small ornate cage dangling carelessly from one hand. Where... how is Kieran? Best left alone, I'd say, until he works off his current broodiness. In the meantime, I just found uh, the thing for our new pets. They should feel right at home. Oleander holds up a cage, showing off two very indignant mice crouched inside. This is beyond insulting. Would you prefer to be at the mercy of a bored wildcat or hungry raven? No? Then you'll stay put, be thankful, till we figure out our next move. At least now, everyone sees you as the vermin you are. Longclaw ambles over to the small cage and sniffs it curiously. Lustric recoils, eyeing Longclaw with distaste. Oh, change us back quickly before this thing gets hungry. They can't. The curse is unbreakable. Unbreakable. Mouse Radiance slumps against the side of his cage, a small voice bitter. Why do you think I used those berries to curse Gleam in the first place? We needed her out of the way permanently. There has to be a way. Just because you don't know a cure doesn't mean there isn't one. Every curse has a weakness. We broke Karen's, we'll find a way to break this one. Your perpetual optimism is even more grating than I remember. Ella, I tried. Garen tried. No spell or counter curse would take hold. So we'll find something else. We're not giving up on Longclaw. I'm telling you, there's no point. Don't worry, Longclaw. We'll find a way, I promise. Fine! work, cousin. Too bad Blaze and my brightness are dead. I would love to see them bear witness to the failure of their golden chill child. Hmm, Gleam is a lucky one. At least she no longer comprehends the shame and indignity of living as an animal. You have no idea what Longclaw comprehends. All we know is right now she can't tell us. And if you thought that Longclaw was ever ashamed of who she was, then you never knew her at all. She was happy the way she was, proud to be at the head of the house household for a magnificent palace respected and loved. Lustrick rolls with cruel, chittering laughter. Oh, <laughs> proud of being a servant of Beast. Why do you think she never asked Karen to break her curse? Radiance falls silent. It's hard to read the expression on his mousy face, but he almost seems ashamed. Longclaw so badly wanted to believe Radiance could change. Maybe if he could see the world through Longclaw's eyes, he would start to understand. Now is her chance to help Radiance remember his former love for Longclaw, and maybe influence a permanent change of heart. Diamond choice. 
Did you just call me a... I know, I know. How dare I? Hush, Oleander, I need to borrow Radiance for a bit. What? Why? Oleander catches the gleam in your eye and smiles. Oh, as it pleases, your grace. Oleander conjures a new cage and deftly moves a squeaking, wriggling lustre into it. Let me go! We're going to have so much fun. It's been ages since we've had tea together. As Oleander flits away with an angrily squeaking lustre in your hand, you scoop up Radiance's cage. Where are we going? I'm going to show you how wrong you are about Longclaw. This is Longclaw's second favorite room, after the kitchen. Here, she got to show off her most elaborate efforts. All of this tells me is that Gleam is demeaned herself as a servant of a rival prince rather than earning the crown herself. Which is why I was able to take it from her. The Sun Court would only suffer under such weak leadership. You're missing the point. She took pride in her work. Also, caring for people made her happy. Both of which are correct. Rank, titles, never matter to her. She isn't afraid to get her hands dirty and do other work others would find demeaning. Because it's still important to work. She kept this place running basically single-handed for decades. She's dedicated, loyal, always willing to help others. The Sun Court needs more like her. Radiance scowls at you with beady eyes. What would you know? I've learned a lot about Faye in the past year. More so, I know your history. The court's founders had to change the very nature of magic to keep you from annihilating yourselves. Longclaw never craved power, but her love for others is exactly what makes her best suited to wield it. A Fae later would be more, most powerful and ruthless of the court. Not simply a good cook. Besides, the Sun Court servants' banquets are far grander than this table could ever hold. It's not all the same. It's not made by Longclaw out of love. Ridiculous mortal sentimentality. All your food was made by mortals, too. Enchanted to remember their own names. Which is another thing Longclaw would never do. She respected me, even though I was a mortal bound to care and service, and she pays and cares for her own servants. She gives them a home. Yes, yes, it's all very inefficient. What is your point? Have you ever eaten a meal prepared by someone who loved you? What difference would it make? You shake your head and move along to the next room. There's more, is there? I suppose I have little choice in the matter. You haven't gotten a chance to see how we've renovated the Moon Palace since you were last here. You stole around the room, making sure to lift the cage to show Radiance every detail. It's beautiful. Long Claw was already Sun Queen when the renovations were completed, but you can see her influence everywhere. The flowers, the gossamer curtains, even the couches were her idea. Am I supposed to be impressed? You're supposed to appreciate the thoughtful details. The curtains that let more light into what used to be a dark and dreary place. Plenty of seating for all the parties she hoped we'd throw. She was full of good ideas for how to make this place welcoming and comfortable, even when Karen wasn't ready for it to be. She always did care more for others' comfort than her own. What was that? Radiant starts as if embarrassed. I mean, it's pathetic. How has she let everyone walk all over her? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's move along, shall we? What's the point of showing me this dump? It has seen better days. This is one of the rooms that fell into disuse during Kieran's curse. He didn't entertain much. And I'm supposed to now, and I suppose now you will, subject me to more maudlin drivel. It's not nice to be forced into things against your will, is it? Now be quiet. You lift the cage up so he can see better. 
Nothing's been touched because Karen wants to get Longclaw's input on how to restore this room for the new era of the Mo Moon Corps. No one should value a servant that much. Even one who is secretly a royal, it's an unbecoming. Longclaw ran this house by herself. Once upon a time, Karen's value, her opinion, their friends. You once desired my friendship. How well did that work out for you? I came to you when I was in trouble because I thought you cared, and you used it against me. Just because you have no use for it, it doesn't mean friendship is weak or pathetic. It means you were taught wrong. You were the one who was manipulated, Radiance, by your uncles against a sister who only ever loved and cared for you. Growing up under the brutal pressure of rule, the cruelty of your family, didn't you even once wish Longcall was there to help you? Didn't you ever miss the sister that protected you the way that no one else would? Longclaw thinks about you all the time, even now. Why do you insist on using that beastly name? Her name is Gleam. Hmm, a little fire in there. No, Gleam is the person you tried to kill. That's not who she is anymore. Here, your sister finally had the freedom to become the version of herself that she wanted to be. That person's name is Longclaw. And even after everything you did to her, Longclaw still protected you from Jack. Because she loves you. Turn your back on that kind of love if you wish, but you'll never fi again find its equal. Radiance falls silent at last. Sensing he has seen enough, you head back to the kitchens. You find Longclaw snoozing contently by the warm stove. As you enter, she lifts her head drowsily. <clears throat> it's just us, Longclaw. You set Radiance's cage down next to her, and she sniffs him curiously. Don't leave me here, she'll eat me. No, she won't. She loves you so much that she recognizes you, even when she's a bear and you're a rat. You mean mouse! Isn't that what I said? Radiance watches Longclaw wearily, but she only sniffs the cage. She gives a contented grunt and settles her head down next to him. What? What am I supposed to do? I suggest talking to her. Longclaw? Is all you have left. It's been a long, boring life for you in that cage, with only lustry for company. Talk to your sister. She did this for you. You owe her your life. Death would have been kinder. I never thought someone like you would traffic in self-hatred. Maybe that's why you resent your sister so much, because she sees parts of you that you want to hide. Take a long, deep breath, willing yourself to calm down as you run your hands through Longclaw's soft fur. She may not be able to understand you, but she likes knowing you're here. For a while, the only sound is the crackle of the fireplace, but then Radius wraps his long pink tail around himself, tugging at it nervously. Longclaw, are you going to eat me? Longclaw blinks slowly, focused intently on the little mouse inside the cage, but makes no effort to eat him. I suppose you think this was funny. I think it's time to take my leave. You back away quietly, unnoticed by either. No, you wouldn't, would you? A time when we were children, Blaze punished me for feeding a squirrel by turning me into one. You didn't laugh at me then even though you should have. <sighs> Last week, you certainly found it amusing to chase me into the garden, pelt me with acorns. No, you found me there, and it leaves. Hiding like the childish coward I was, kept me in your room until the magic wore off. What was it you said, that it was not a crime to be kind to something smaller than yourself? As you ease out of the door, you hear Radiant sigh. I hardly remember what you look like as Gleam, but I remember that. I wonder. Longclaw, what advice would you give me now? Well, it's a start at least.
You find Kieran alone in the gardens, progressing through a series of precise movements with his sword. Oh. His form is breathtaking. You're rooted to the spot, awestruck by the power of his body, the fluid grace with which he handles the blade. That's beautiful. Kieran swings the sword in a graceful, powerful arc, finally breaking concentration to take note of you standing there. Hmm. I'm woefully out of practice. What do you mean? You have an impeccable form. I could watch you all day. Kieran attempts a half-hearted smirk, but it quickly fades back into a scowl. Jack doesn't know what's coming to him. Kieran scoffs, turning his back to reset his stance. I'm not nearly good enough to beat that scum, not when he's armed with an iron sword. Kieran, how are you? I'm unhurt. The moon source strengthened me, but it won't last. That's not what I meant. Kieran rotates his wrist, swinging the sword in a slow circle. I'm still not strong enough to break Longclaw's curse and having to host the pair of vermin under my roof. Also the fact that the Sun Palace is destroyed. With an angry growl, Kieran lunges and stabs an imaginary foe. We'll break Longclaw's curse, somehow. We broke your curse. There's always a way, and I know we'll find it. Kieran's pessimistic expression softens, just for a moment. I hope you're right, but until then... I'm now the only Fae powerful enough to hope to defeat Jack. I must be ready. As Kieran's sword slices through the air, you remember how helpless you felt back at the Sun Palace. Perhaps I should be, should be seeing this cure for mortality Jack wants so bad. At least then I'd be able to help instead of just being a liability. Karen whirls, dropping a sword to his side, expression horrified. Ella, no. Mortals are not meant to use magic. Those who try suffer terrible consequences. Sir Monty told me the risks, but maybe it's worth it to... You do not understand. The lucky ones simply die. The rest become twisted, unrecognizable as they what they once were. Kieran stabs the sword into the grass and marches over to grab you by the shoulders. You must promise me you will never ever attempt such a thing. But... Promise me. I promise. I'm sorry. I didn't know what I was thinking. His expression eases into relief. Thank you, beloved. I understand the temptation, but it's too dangerous. He releases you to return to his swordplay. You watch Kieran a while, trying to decide how to even begin to talk about Jack. When he finally breaks to join you, you still haven't figured up how to plan. You look as though you have something on your mind. I'm just admiring my prince's impressive skill with the blade. He gives you a knowing, disappointed look. Ella. All right, but you're not gonna like it. At the Sun Palace, I learned something about your mother. You can tell that this is the last thing he expected you to say. He swallows hard, preparing for the worst. What did you learn? Before Jack killed Lord Brightness, I heard them talking. Brightness recognized Jack as your mother's... I mean, as Isis's son. Ellie, you must be confused. That's not possible. Kieran, Jack knew your mother's name. It seemed she had an affair with a human while she was still at the Sun Court, before she met your father, and she fell pregnant by him. Apparently, Blaze and Brightness demanded that she dispose of the changeling child, but she hid him instead. <clears throat> Jacob has a step towards Kieran. It makes sense. Why Jack hates the Fae so much? Sir Monty's last words. He was close with your mother. He must have known. Kieran's eyes are wide. Something feral and desperate burning within. You can't seem to look at you. Kieran, this doesn't have to change your view on your mother. Unless you want it to. She still was everything you admire. All the fond memories you have, all the good all qualities you've told me about, this doesn't cancel out any of that. This... I... this can't be. 
He suddenly snarls, lifting the sword over his head and whirling. Hack at the stone wall with a resounding blow. Damn it! His breath shudders out of him as he strikes the wall again and again, sparks and stones flying. Why? Why would she never tell me I had a half-brother all of this time? Even my own mother kept secrets from me. And now, now I must kill the last of my own blood? The final anguished roar he strikes so hard it snaps the blade into the lingering metallic resonance echoes in the silence. Disgusted, he throws the broken hilt to the dirt, shoulders heaving with labored breaths. Kieran, Isa must have had her reasons. Try not to judge her too harshly. She must have done the only thing she thought was right. I have always trusted her judgment until now. We are paying for the price of the secrets she chose to keep. Are you angrier, Jack, or your mother? I don't know. Jack is a barbaric murderer. He threatens all I hold dear. That I share the same blood with such a man sickens me. But my mother kept him from me all these years, if I'd known. Do you think things would have been different? I don't know. But above all others, I trusted my mother to never be false with me. It was my mistake. She was the, the sun court. It is in their nature. Karen, don't say that. Longclaw. Longclaw is lost, Ella, because of me, because of Monty, because of who loved her too and lied to her, lied to all of us. Heart wrenching your rage for him. Don't. You flinch away from the heat of his rage. There's instant apologetic shame in his dark eyes, his voice strained and hoarse. Ella, I'm... You must stay away from me tonight. I'm not myself. I'm not afraid of you, Kieran. We can talk through this. Let me help you. There's no amount of talking that can soothe me. I am a danger to you like this. He turns away to leave, mounting the steps of the palace that you follow. I won't leave you alone in this state. Kieran stalks toward you, each step thundering with dark, fiery power, and takes the nape of your neck in a grip like steel. An answering heat roars to life within you, and even as your body lights up in response to the threat of danger, every nerve is instantly, utterly attuned to him. An electric crackle lights up around your throat, sparking down your chest. Kieran's hand snakes down, and you feel the chain of moonlight pull taut, even through your clothing, drawing you close as heat rises beneath you. I am in no mood for argument. You must go. His voice is weighted with heavy authority, a dangerous centuries-old commanding prince of Fae used for giving orders and having them obeyed. There is no gentleness in me. I am a more beast than Fae, and right now it is taking all my power not to savage you like one. Kieran. You meet his eyes defiantly, see them burning with desperate, tumultuous lust for violence, for release, for you. If you stay, you will see the darkest parts of me. Be sure of your choice. Tonight I am beyond all ability for restraint. Uh-huh. You pull a clearing here and close, sensing barely contained violence in every taut muscle and staccato breath. He growls through his scrunched teeth. Bella. His hands fisted his sides as though he's struggling to hold himself back. You could never scare me away, Karen. Nothing about you frightens me, no matter how angry or frustrated you are, I'm here. I know you. I love you. Both your darkness and your light. You don't know what you're offering. I'm offering myself, my love. What you're going through, we can go through together. Trust me to take what comes. Giggity. You lean in a whisper in his ear, the thrill of danger sparking a shivery heat inside you. Give me your worst. I can bear it. His eyes narrow, he tugs your head back, exposing your thrumming. 
balls. You're certain of that, are you? I am. You always try to send me away, protect me, but I don't need to be protected from you. I've seen you at your worst before. There is a fierce, cold lust in his eyes, an animal hunger that is utterly confident in what it wants from you. And how to get it. No, you haven't. With a deep, sonorous growl, he snatches you off your feet. A shudder runs down him as feathers and wings erupt as in his eyes go fully black. But you're about to. Kieran takes off, leaping powerfully in the sky. There's a wild rush of wind, and Kieran alights the open windowsill of his room. Hmm. With a growl, Kieran tosses you unceremoniously on the bed. Your back hits the mattress with a jolt, and Kieran is above you, holding himself back through obvious effort of will, every muscle taut. I could break you without even trying, Ella. This is your last warning. You cup his cheek tenderly, feeling the locked muscles of his jaw, his tense, short breath against your skin. Kieran, no you can't. You can never do anything to me that I couldn't handle. Whatever you give, I can endure. I am the one thing in this room you can't destroy. I am a monster, Ella. You are wrong. With an animalistic snarl, his mouth descends on yours, all teeth in vicious need. You gasp as your clothes burn to cinders beneath his touch, leaving you bare and vulnerable. He steals your next words in another brutal kiss, pressing the length of his naked body heavily down on you. I love the sound of my name in your mouth. Say it again. Kieran. Tell me you are mine alone, that you will never leave me. You know that already. Tell me. You repeat the words, and he growls against your mouth the moment you finish, his tongue sweeping over yours in a possessive invasion. You'll be good and do as you're told. You will have to make me. You meet his blazing eyes with a calm, mischievous defiance, delight dancing in your belly. If you want my obedience, you'll have to earn it. Show me your power, Night Prince, and I will kneel at your feet. The sound Garen makes rocks you to your core. You know you're on dangerous ground, but something in you dares to jump. Oh, you will do better than that. He grabs your hips, flips you, pins you face down in a single motion. Your arms folded, the small of your back trapped in his grip. Without warning, he delivers a sharp, stinging smack across your bare ass, just above your thigh. Your hips drive under the mattress, but there's nowhere to escape. You cry out when he does it again to the other side. My brave Ella, you can take this. You asked for it, did you not? You want to feel the force of my power. Test my limits. He continues in steady, merciless rhythm that drowns out everything else. The burn spreads up and into your core, searing you from within. Soon, you're twisting, moaning with fiery one, seeking friction against the mattress, nearly beyond words. If you seek punishment, I will give it to you, because you are mine. Act out all you want. I will bring you back to heal, you can trust that. His palm soothes over the residual burn each time, only delivered anew until your yelps is all in a panting, incoherent moans of need. The spell breaks suddenly as you feel the chain pull taut on your skin, lifting you from the bed with one effortless fl flick of his hand. You Then you're flying backwards, furniture sailing out of the way until under Karen's blazing gaze. Your back hits the wall, the impact somehow only making the heat in you climb higher as he descends upon you like the fall of night. Kieran. He's panting as his hand works its way roughly between your legs, a satisfied cocky growl humming in his throat to find you shivering. Mmm, that's what I thought. 
Rot Row. Surprisingly, it did not add or basically last much longer. Anyway, tangled in curtains, you share a breathless laughter. After a moment to catch your breath, Karen helps you up and steers you to the bed. He runs a finger along your cheek, gazing at you with all the love in the world in his eyes. Are you feeling any better? Yes. You don't sound certain. He hesitates and you force him to look at you. Am I your equal, Karen? You are more than that. You are the other half of my heart. Then let me share your burdens equally. Tell me what's troubling you. I should not need to rely on your help, however grateful I am for it. I should be the one to support and protect you. He secures you in his arms, breathing guilt-stricken words against your cheek. I promise you will not have to take care of me like this again. Karen, that's not what love is. Love doesn't only flow in one direction. You take care of me, protect me, and I do the exact same for you. But... No buts! Whether you like it or not, your highness prince Kieran of the Moon Court, you're allowed to rely on other people. I know you're used to being alone, but you have people who love you, who want to help you. And you need to trust that just as much as you want to help and protect those you love, we want to do the same for you. We can do the same for you. I know you're afraid to lose us, but keeping us, keeping me at a distance, you're pushing that love away, don't you see? You may have a point. Of course I do. Now close your eyes. Let me take care of you a little longer. I'll try. Karen nestles his face in you, giving himself over to the gentle embrace and drifting to an exhausted sleep moments before you do the same. The next morning, you let Oleander sleep in and head to see or Karen sleep in and head to see Oleander, who primly offers you tea and scones. Did you get anything useful out of Lustry? Not yet, but I will. Radiance is still rather um, sullen. But Lone Claw was quite comfortably snoozing when I left her, and seems content enough. Maybe she remembers that this was home. Willing to push her down their teacup, eyeing you with a wary curiosity as a morosely pick at the food. You know I'm happy to uh, breakfast with you, Ella, but you're obviously preoccupied. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company this morning? I'm just... Only her watches you with flounder for a moment, then holds up a calming hand to stay your ramblings. Perhaps now is a good time to tell you that I heard you and Karen talking yesterday. I bet you did. What did you hear? Something along the lines of scream, scream, half-brother, scream, scream, my mother, scream, I filled in the blanks. So, you can comfortably assume I am up to speed. Oh, you didn't hear the other screams. Whew, I was a little concerned. You don't seem at all surprised that Jack is Kieran's half-mortal brother. Of course Isa had secrets. What noble doesn't? It's not the first time a bastard changeling love child has come to light, and it won't be the last. I wish I could understand why. For Kieran to fight his own brother that Jack kills for Monty, surely this is not what their mother would have wanted. I don't know how to fix this. I feel like we're missing key parts of the story. The Sun Court is not known for its empathy, especially towards human. Isa did not fit there any better than I did. Little wonder she hid Jack away the Sun Court home to a changeling unthinkable, especially with Lord Blazes and Brightness at the helm. Was the Sun Court truly so cruel? Crueler, even. I'm not surprised that Isa appears to have abandoned him, but I am astounded that Jack is still alive. Fae freely have dalliances with mortals, but any offspring of such unions are considered shameful by mistakes, hated by Fae and feared by mortals. So Jack has every reason to hate both courts. I'd say so, but you know this makes Jack more dangerous, don't you? What do you mean? Changeling magic is wildly unpredictable. Some can even be powerful as Fae, while appearing fully human. But... He must not have all the power of Fae if he seeks the mortality cure. Yes, but the sun source, he is now more powerful than any Fae, save Kirin. 
He will surely come after the moon source next. If the Sun Palace fell with all the guards and strength, what hope do we have? Will the trials of the moon be enough to hold him back if, if we need to flee? There are unfortunately more, shall we say, primitive ways of accessing the source chamber. Even given enough time and enough of those ungainly contraptions Eclipse carries around, I'm certain the catacombs would collapse. Fear closes around your heart, but then you remember. What if we could foil his plans before he got here? Whatever do you mean? There's still the ancient carvings we saw. The moon source isn't the only thing he needs for the mentality cure. There's another item depicted in the runes. Jack's forces mentioned they were looking for something at the Sun Palace, but couldn't find it. Maybe that was what they were searching for. We need to get it first. It sounds like a wild goose hunt, Ella. And I do not think it wise to leave the moon source unprotected. We should focus on shoring up our defenses such as they are and prepare for Jack's imminent arrival. Jack lost a good deal of his forces at the Sun Palace. He'll need to regroup before coming after us. If we find the artifact first, we'll be able to uh, keep him from t making himself immortal. Ella, be reasonable. We have no idea what the artifact is, what it looks like, or where it might be. It could be at the bottom of the ocean, for all we know. Thinking back on what you overheard, you wins. I have a feeling I know where to start looking. After some hasty explanations and an uncomfortable carriage ride, you sit stiffly on Magpie's couch between Oleander and Kieran. I still don't like this. Kieran, if we only socialized with people who we haven't upset, we wouldn't socialize at all. Ella be calm. Sorry, I just can't imagine she'll be happy to see me since the last time I was here, I stole from her. The Magpie's first experience with angering a ruler of Fae seems to have taught her not to hold any trespasses against them. She'll get over it. And technically, I'll only return which what belonged to me in the first place. A technicality which no doubt prevented her from killing you on sight. Kieran's title got us past the threshold. Now we must rely on our charm and your deception. Lovely. Any etiquette advice that might help, Oleander? Oh. The magpie lives outside the courtly norms. I improvised. Wonderful. He freezes the door opens, the magpie enters, a face sour and sarcastically nods to Kieran. I assume the moon court has reason for this unexpected call. Come to trade with me again, your highness. Two armored guards follow her in, and you can't help but suspect one of them is the man you lied to to enter the magpie's vault. At least I attempted an honest dealing with you. Be grateful I did not deem it necessary to seek retribution for refusing a fair trade for something that was mine. What Prince Kieran means is that we have come in good faith, willing to set aside past transgressions for the mutual benefit of both of our interests. What benefit? I should be gracious or direct. Well, the whole social norms of the Fey and literally improvise mean direct. I know your time is valuable, so I'll cut to the chase. You are in danger. We want to help. The magpie eyes you suspiciously. My sources have told me of this war. You have the changing Jack and his army. Leave me out of it. But Jack seeks the destruction of both courts. Bah! The Sun Court cast me off hundreds of years ago. I care not. Jack has stolen the Sun Source. He's more powerful than ever, and he seeks to destroy all Fae. And you are in his sights, Magpie. Why? We believe you are in possession of something he needs. More importantly, Jack believes you have it. My defenses are considerable, as you yourself have experienced, Your Highness. Your defenses may buy you enough time to survive, but Eclipse's iron weapons will wear you down, Magpie. You will have to flee without all of your treasures. Magpie pauses, horrified, before steepling her feathered fingers. What item does Jack think I have? An ancient artifact from the founding of the Fey Courts. Something that may be connected to the Fey's immortality. I may have such an item in my collection. We are happy to take it off your hands. 
for free. We'd be doing you a favor while you have it. You're a target. Let us leave with the artifact and Jack will come after us instead of you. You shoot a sidelong glance to Kieran, whose brow lifts incrementally. He do she doesn't seem keen on the idea. You watch her body language intently, but her strange mannerisms are impossible to read. Then begrudgingly, she scoffs. Fine, you have convinced me. I will give you the artifact for safekeeping, mind you. Thank you. Magpie holds up one gnarled finger, glaring at you sternly. But first, I demand recompense for this mortal's robbery of my vault last year. Magpie, we've been over this. The heart piece was rightfully mine. Her mood brightens falsely. She moves on as if Kirin had not spoken. Luckily for you, I already know what you may do to repay me. Name your price, Magpie. There's something I desire for my collection. A bird with the most beautiful song one has ever heard. A bird. Oh no. A one of a kind. Magical golden bird. I must have it. Fetch me this bird and I will trade it for the artifact you would desire. You turn her words over in your mind, looking for some fey deception, but she seems straightforward enough. Karen looks to you and then Oleander. We accept your generous offer. Wait, where do we find this bird? It should not be no trouble at all for you to acquire. Consider your recent acquaintance with the current owner. A conniving smile creeps across the magpie's face. The bird I desire lives deep in the heart of Opulence's famous orchards. I'm really hoping it's not the bird I think it is. Anyway, without further ado, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down the description, plenty of things to check out there. Also, check out the things where you can do with the YouTube interface, which is the join button, and also the thanks button. There are two ways of showing your support if you deem me worthy and necessary. I would hope so for all the work that I put into this community and this channel over all these years. We're talking about 12 years, I'd say, at this point. A lot of hard work, a lot of videos, thousands of them. A lot of uh, reading, voicing, gaming, reviews, the whole nine yards. So, again, any and all support is very much appreciated. Um, even if you're not able to do that, again, doing, you know, the liking, sharing, and the whole nine yards really go a whole lengthy more way than not subscribing, not liking, and not doing really anything other than just watching content. So, please keep that in mind. So, with that being said, I hopefully you all did enjoy. Let me know in the comment section what you thought, and I'll catch you all in the next video. Peace out.